Hello. In this video, we're going to look at a quick review of the algebra skills necessary for calculus. The first thing we're going to look at is distribution. So let's say you have 2x plus 1 times 3x minus 5, and we need to distribute this. Hopefully you remember the acronym FOIL from grade 10 or grade 11 pre-calculus. It stands for first, outside, inside, and last. So what we do is we multiply the first two pieces, or the first two terms, 2x and 3x, which will give us 6x squared. Then we do the outside, which is the 2x and the 5, giving us negative 10x. Next we do the inside terms, the 1 and the 3x, giving us plus 3x. And finally, the last, which is the 1 and the negative 5, giving us negative 5. Now, usually when you do FOIL, the middle two terms simplify, so we should clean that up as 6x squared minus 7x minus 5. Now, another thing that's important to do in calculus is to simplify. So you might be given something like this, s squared t over u times ut over negative 2, and we need to simplify it. Well, what you can do first, of course, is multiply the tops and multiply the bottoms of the fraction. So we would get here s squared, and then the two t's would give us t squared, and then a u, over u, and then a negative 2. Next up, we could definitely cancel those u's, and so we'd get s squared t squared over negative 2. And if you want, this is usual for fractions, we'll just put that negative out in front. The negative can be on the top or the bottom or out in front on a fraction, and it's customary to put the negative out in front. Now let's try some factoring. See if we remember our factoring skills. So here we have x squared minus 6x plus 9, which means we need to find two numbers that multiply to give 9 and add to give negative 6. Well, if you think about the numbers that multiply to 9, well, you've got 1 and 9, or you've got 3 and 3. So we're thinking probably 3 and 3. We've got to give negative 6, so let's make them both negative. Negative 3 plus negative 3 will be negative 6, and so our factor is x minus 3, x minus 3. Which, again, it's nice to simplify that all the way as x minus 3 squared. Now let's try to factor this, 4x squared minus 25. Well, you could do a similar factoring technique, but this is going to be a special factor because if you notice, 4x squared and 25, they're both perfect squares. And so in this case, you have a difference of squares, which means, and again, if you want to write it, it's 2x all squared minus 5 squared. They're both perfect squares. So our factoring is just 2x minus 5 and 2x plus 5, which is a lot quicker because, well, we have a difference of squares. Now, one of the things we're going to do in this course is quick multiple choice questions. They're not for marks. They're just to gauge your understanding to help make sure you understand the content being covered and to make sure I know you understand what's going on. Now, on these online videos, unfortunately, I can't get your feedback of how you're doing, but when we do them in class, you can definitely hold up your clicker. It's going to be a piece of paper that indicates whether you have chosen A, B, C, or D, and it helps me read the room quickly to see if we're all understanding the concepts. So let's try one here. Let's try to simplify e to the power of 3 ln 6. So pause the video and think about which one of these would be the answer to the simplification of e to the 3 ln 6. All right, so hopefully you realize that we can use some rules here. We can write this as e ln 6 to the power of 3. We can bring that 3 up and make it an exponent using log rules. And then e and ln of inverses are inverses of each other, so we just get 6 to the power of 3, which is going to be 216. Let's try another one here. Let's find the exact value of tan inverse of 1. So pause the video and give it a try. All right, so hopefully you remember the inverse here. This deals with the opposite, or doing the reverse value. This says not tan of 1, but it says on the unit circle, where do we have 
one? What angle gives us one? And if you think about it on the unit circle, at 45 degrees, we're going to have root 2 over 2 and root 2 over 2. So tan, of course, is going to be sine over cos. And if we divide those two, we get 1. So the angle is 45, which we write in radians as pi by 4. Let's try one more here. Find the range of y equals 2 plus cos x. So go ahead and pause the video and give it a try. All right, so hopefully you're coming up with the answer of 1, 2, 3 with closed brackets. Because if you remember, cos looks like this and has a range from, well, 1 up here down to minus 1 down here. And so if we add 2 to it, then that range from negative 1 to 1 gets moved up to 1 to 3. All right, so let's do some more factoring here. Let's say we wanted to factor x cubed plus 8. Well, this isn't a difference of squares, but there's actually something similar going on. Here we have x cubed plus 2 cubed. We have perfect cubes. So we have a sum of cubes. And hopefully you've seen this formula before for factoring. What you get is x plus 2, x squared minus 2x plus 2 squared. Now if you've seen this formula before, it makes sense, but if you haven't, well, I'll give you a quick refresher. If you have a cubed plus b cubed, there is a formula for this. It's a plus b times a squared minus ab plus b squared. So if you have the sum of cubes, there's a formula for that. And actually there's another formula too in case you had a difference. If you had a cubed minus b cubed, you would get a minus b, a squared plus ab plus b squared. These are the formulas for the sum and difference of cubes. Now, it's important that you memorize these formulas because they're very useful for factoring, but just to help you memorize these, what we do is for the a plus b and the a minus b, if you notice all the a's and b's are similar, it's just the signs are different. So the plus 1 goes plus, then negative, because we changed the sign, and then always plus at the end. Similarly for the negative 1, if you're going to subtract the cubes, it's going to be negative, change the sign to plus, and then always plus at the end. So as long as you memorize one of these formulas, you should be able to get the other one by just playing around with the signs. And so here we have our nice, fully factored version of our cubes. Now, Again, if you still don't believe that this formula is true, if you're still a little doubtful that this did factor it correctly, well, what we could do is do our synthetic. So let's look at x cubed plus 8. Well, clearly, if I plugged in x equal to negative 2, if I check x equal to negative 2, then I would get negative 2 cubed plus 8, which would give me negative 8 plus 8, which would give me 0. So I know negative 2 will be a root, and I can go ahead and try this out. So I'll have 1, 0x squared, 0x, and 8. Bring down the 1, multiply the negative 2. Negative 2, multiply to give me 4. 4, multiply to give me negative 8, 0. And so I'll have x plus 2, x squared minus 2x plus 4. So if you do it the long way with synthetic, you'll find that you get the same answer here as you do by using the formula. All right, so enough with the sum and difference of cubes. Let's try another simplification problem here. We want to simplify x squared minus 16 over x squared minus 2x minus 8. Well, to simplify, whenever you have a polynomial on top of another polynomial, you want to factor. So you get x minus 4, x plus 4, over, well, two numbers that multiply to give negative 8 and add to give negative 2. I'm thinking negative 4 and positive 2. That looks good. Now I can go ahead and simplify. Cross off the negative 4, leaving me with simply x plus 4 over x plus 2. A nice simple version of what was initially a lot more complicated. Now one more thing we should remember, completing the square, you might remember this from grade 11, it was important with parabolas, and we will use this skill again in calculus. 
So let's try to complete this square. You start off by writing x squared plus x, and then I always take that one and I just move it over here. I just put it away from the question I'm working on. And well, I take this x, there's an invisible little one here, and I need to add something here to make this portion a perfect trinomial. The number I need to add is gonna be whatever this one is, in this case it's a one, it might be a two or a three. I take that number and I half it and I square it. So I do half it and then square it. Half of one is a half and one half squared will be a quarter. But of course if I just go adding a quarter here, I have to subtract a quarter because it's math, I have to keep it balanced. So that will give me x plus one half squared. That's gonna be the factoring of this trinomial right here. And over here I can just use fractions, that will be three quarters. Right, because one minus one quarter will be four over four minus one over four, which is just three over four. And there you have it, a completed square. Let's do one more question here. Factor question mark. Do you think we could factor this? Well, we could try. We could try to find two numbers that multiply to give two and add to give one. Well, the numbers that multiply to two are just one and two. Well, I don't know if I could make those add to give, well, I guess maybe if one of them was negative, but then they wouldn't multiply to two and, hmm, I'm, I'm having a little trouble here. What I can do if I think the thing doesn't factor is I can go ahead and check the discriminant. Hopefully you remember b squared minus 4ac. Remember it's that portion of the quadratic formula that's underneath the root. And so here we have our a value and our b value and our c value. So a is going to be 1, b is 1, and c is 2. Let's plug all those numbers in. 1 squared minus 4 times 1 times 2. So it'll be 1 minus 8, so it's going to be negative 7. Oh, hey, look, that's less than 0. If my discriminant here is less than 0, what that means is that, therefore, it is not factorable. If the discriminant was, was positive or was equal to 0, then you could factor. But if you get a negative discriminant, then you just can't factor, and you've got to move on to the next polynomial. Let's look at another skill, expanding. Let's try to expand a plus b cubed. a plus b cubed. Well, you could expand it like this. a plus b times a plus b times a plus b. And then you could expand, well, I guess the first two, so it'll be a squared plus ab plus ab plus b squared. I guess we could combine those terms, so a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And then you could expand again, but I don't really want to personally. This is taking a long time. What I would rather do is remember my friend Pascal. So remember this little triangle that we make? Well, we're doing here the power of 3, which means we look at, the first row doesn't count, but we look at this row right here. You can think of it as the fourth row or the third row, not counting the first one. So 1, 3, 3, 1. That means when I expand it, I should get 1, 3, 3, 1. I start with all of the power on the A. Then I take one off the A and add one to the B. Take another one off the A and add it to the B. And finally put it as all B. Put pluses in the middle, and there you go. Remember, that's expanding using the binomial theorem. All right, let's try some simplifying with exponents. So here we have x over y cubed, which we could write as x cubed over y cubed. Now, on the other side, we've got y squared x over z, and we can again take this exponent of four and put it on each one of these. Well, when we do y squared, to the power of four, we're gonna have power to a power. And in that case, 
we have to multiply the exponents 2 times 4, which will be 8. So y to the 8, x to the 4, over z to the 4. So that'll give us x to the 7, combining the x to the 3 and x to the 4, y to the 8, y to the 3, z to the 4. Now here, this y and this y, we can think about canceling some of them, or we could think about using exponent rules. If you have the same base, you can subtract them. So y to the 8 and y to the 3 will give us y to the 5. So finally, we have x to the 7, y to the 5, z to the 4. Let's look at another skill that's important for calculus, rationalizing. So rationalizing is where you multiply by the conjugate. In this case, we have root x minus 4. And so the conjugate is where we simply change the sign in the middle. Minus becomes plus, plus becomes minus. So we multiply by root x plus 4. Now, I know you might say, Mr. Peters, why are you rationalizing? This already seems rationalized. The root is in the top, that's good. Well, when I say rationalize, I mean there's a root and we want to get rid of the root. We don't really care whether that root is on the top or the bottom. We just need to do some work getting rid of a root. And so in this case, even though you've already got the root on the top, we're still going to do this method of multiplying by the conjugate. And you'll see why in a moment. So this will give us, well, root x times x, which gives me just x. When you multiply by the conjugate, the middle terms disappear, and you just end up with the last term multiplied. So that will be negative 16 over. And I'm not going to actually multiply the bottom. This is going to be a key technique in calculus. When you're rationalizing, just multiply the one you're rationalizing. Don't bother multiplying the other one. Because chances are, and you probably see it right here, x minus 16, x minus 16, something usually cancels when you rationalize. If we were to multiply it out, we wouldn't actually see that cancellation. So we're left with 1 over root x plus 4. Let's look at another question here. Let's simplify x squared. Well, you might just say x. But unfortunately, that's not entirely correct. The square root of x squared is not x. It's the absolute value of x. And to see why, let's say, um, let's let x equal to 3. Well, the square root of 3 squared is the square root of 9, which is 3. But what if we let x equal to negative 2? The square root of negative 2 squared is going to equal the square root of 4, which is 2. Wait a minute. I put the number negative 2 into the square root of x squared. When I put the number 3 in, well, I got 3 out. But when I put the number negative 2 in, I got the number 2 out. Here I got the same thing, but here the sign disappeared. And that's because when you square root a square, you don't just get the number out. You always get the absolute value of the number out. And this is important. You could even do this on Desmos, and I'll show you in a second. If you square root x squared, it doesn't look like the line y equals x. It looks like the graph y equals absolute value x. So here we see the graph of y equals square root of x squared. And here we see the graph of y equals x. And we can see clearly those are not the same thing. They might be the same initially on the right-hand side of 0. But on the left, that square root of x squared is not giving us x. It's giving us the absolute value of x. Now, you might have been told that the square root of x squared is just x. Um, and that's not entirely correct. And you need to make sure you update your thinking here. If x is positive, sure, it works out that the square root of x squared is just x. But if we're looking at negative numbers, we get that absolute value. And this will be important as we go through the course. So just make sure you're not square rooting squares and just always putting x every time, because that's not entirely accurate. Let's try a few more multiple choice questions here. What if you expanded x plus y squared? So pause the video and give it a try. All right, so the answer would be d. x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. Let's try to simplify this. x to the 4n, x to the 5n plus 1, over x to the n minus 5. So pause the video and give it a try. All right, so if we combine those first two, we're going to get x to the 9n 
plus 1 over x to the n minus 5. Then we can subtract these, so 9n minus n will be 8n, and 1 subtract negative 5 will be equal to 6. So the answer would be A. Now we're going to look at the definition of the absolute value because that came up in the last question, the square root of x squared. Well, the absolute value of a real number denoted with vertical bars of A is the distance from A to 0 on the number line. So if I've got the absolute value of A, what I mean is I'm trying to measure how far A is from 0. And if A is a positive number, it's just A. But if A is a negative number, I have to put a negative sign in front of A because we have this negative number. So negative negative will make a positive. Let's try an example. Let's find the absolute value of 7 minus 12. We want to rewrite this without the absolute value symbol. So we'll do the stuff inside first. 7 subtract 12 will be negative 5. And then the absolute value of negative 5 is going to be, again, you can think of it as negative negative 5, or simply 5. Let's try one with multiple absolute values. So here we have the absolute value of the absolute value of negative 2 minus absolute value 7. It's a little weird to say, but we'll get 2 minus 7. So that'll be negative 5. So again, you can just write 5, but know that what you're doing is taking a negative sign and putting it in front of that negative 5 to give you a positive 5. Now what if you had just x plus 2? Well, in this case, you actually get a piecewise function. You either just get x plus 2, and that's when x plus 2 is positive. Or you get a negative sign in front of it, negative x plus 2. Now that happens when x plus 2 is less than 0. Now, usually we don't write it like this because these inequalities aren't well defined in the sense of we haven't said what x is greater than or less than. We said what x plus 2 is. So we usually move this 2 to the other side. This becomes x greater than or equal to negative 2, and this will be x less than negative 2. So let's just rewrite that a little bit nicer. So we either have x plus 2, or we have negative x plus 2. And that depends on whether x is greater than or equal to negative 2 or other x is less than negative 2. Let's try 3x minus 4. So here we'll get either 3x minus 4 or negative 3x minus 4, depending on whether 3x minus 4 is positive or 3x minus 4 is negative. Now, here we have to rearrange this, so I'll do this on the side. We could move the 4 to the other side, and then divide by 3. So we'll get x is greater than 4 over 3, and then on this one it's going to be x is less than 4 over 3. So we'll rewrite that. 3x minus 4, negative 3x minus 4. x is greater than or equal to 4 over 3 x is less than 4 over 3. So go ahead and try this multiple choice question. Rewrite this without the absolute value. So absolute value of x minus 4. All right, so it's going to be one of these here, and I've actually expanded in the negative. So writing it the usual way we did before would be either x minus 4 or negative x minus 4. And this is when x minus 4 is greater than or equal to 0, or x minus 4 is less than 0. So moving that around, we'll get x greater than or equal to 4. So that definitely gets rid of a and b. Those are incorrect. And here, when I go ahead and expand in the negative on this one, I'll get negative x plus 4. So that's going to give me negative x plus 4 down here, which is d. So the correct answer is d. 
So just a couple more things here to review. Interval notation is very important. We're not really going to use this notation as much in the course. We're mostly going to use interval notation. And I think interval notation is a little cleaner because you can think about it as a number line. So the interval A to B, what that means on a number line is you've got holes at A and B, but you're including everything else along the way. If you put a square bracket on the A, it means you get to include the A. X is going to be greater than or equal to the A. If you want to have a number line that just goes on to positive infinity, well, you just put an infinity and you put a round bracket. And you put a round bracket here because round bracket means you're not including. So in this case, you're not including the A or B. And in the infinity case, you're not including infinity because, well, infinity is not really a number. So the same thing here, if you're going to include all real numbers, it would be negative infinity to infinity, and you'd put round brackets. So let's write the solution to 2x plus 7 is greater than 3 in interval notation. So we'd move the 7 over, and that would become negative 4. We divide by 2, and we get x is greater than negative 2. So on a number line, well, we'd have our point at negative 2, and we're going all the way to infinity. In an interval, it would look like this, negative 2 to infinity. Now, when we divide it by 2, something might have been going on in your head about dividing with integers or dividing with negatives or inequalities or some, something might have been ringing a bell. And there are a few rules here for inequalities. If you have an inequality, you're more than welcome to add and subtract on both sides. It doesn't change the inequality. And if you're going to have a number that is positive, you're more than welcome to multiply both sides or divide both sides in that inequality. But if you have a negative number, and you go ahead and multiply or divide on the inequality, you end up reversing the inequality. You, you might remember this. If you have negative 3x is greater than 6, when you divide by negative 3 and divide by negative 3, you get x is now less than negative 2. It reverses this portion here and here. You get a reverse. But otherwise, inequalities are very similar to working with regular equations. You just have to remember that one little technical detail. Now for homework, please try questions 1 through 142 on algebra practice, and then 149 to 156. I know that's a lot of questions to look at, but I'm not really asking you to do all of them. I'm asking you to look at these questions and do the ones that you need practice on. So each one of them have different sections. There's them on factoring or completing the square. Start doing a question or two from each section, and if you find it really easy, just go ahead and skip that section. But if you find it challenging, do those questions. Do the questions here that you find challenging, that look hard, that look like you need some practice on it. And do them until you feel like you're comfortable with them, and then you can move on to the next section. So there's answers on your handout, and there's full solutions to all the worksheets in this course on the class website. So if you're getting stuck on one of the questions, you're more than welcome to look at the solution to see where you went wrong. So I hope you enjoy doing some of that homework and reviewing some of your algebra skills. And as always, thanks for watching.